I'm starting to see everyone that's signed up. Welcome everyone, you've come to the right place. We're just waiting for everybody to get logged in and we'll get started. Until then, I've instructed everyone else not to say anything crazy or wild yet. Okay, I think it's slowing down. We're close. All right, we're gonna get started really slowly so that the people like me that are having trouble logging in uh, will have plenty of time and not miss much, but uh, welcome to the, um, this is supposed to be a regularly scheduled webinar, but with, with life being crazy in COVID, it's been a little bit more intermittent. It's been a while, so I'm really glad to be in front of all my friends, colleagues, and patients, and a lot of people that aren't there. And I have a very special day today. Um, we have Dr. Stephen Darrington, one of my colleagues who is a pain specialist. And together we're gonna to be talking about one of my favorite topics, uh, this nagging low back pain that affects a large majority of the US population, it turns out, including yours truly, um, in a setting where the pain is, is bad enough to really affect your function and quality of life, but not so bad that you're gonna turn your life upside down and have like some crazy major fusion surgery. So Dr. Darrington is an expert in the field of PRP and, and stem cells and orthobiologics. And as you probably all know, I specialize in uh, mental invasive surgery. So we're gonna talk about what, what I call advanced treatments. So I think people are still straggling, uh, kind of slowly logging in, but I'd like to get started with a presentation to kind of set the background. So I apologize in advance. Uh, this is a good time to take a little nap for about five, 10 minutes. But let me, see I'm one of those people like, hold on, I'm trying to log in. So today's topic is on your spine, specifically looking at disc problems like annular tears as they cause nagging back pain. And we want to focus on kind of the advanced state-of-the-art treatments. I'm Dr. Chol Kim from uh, the Excel Spine Center. Um, and I think I know most of you, or you know most of you know me. But I want to introduce Dr. Stephen Darrington. So he is a pain specialist in Oceanside. And I've heard Oceanside's really nice now. He specializes in regenerative medicine. He's an instructor for the Interventional Orthobiologic Foundation. So he knows a lot about these new technologies and it's a constantly evolving field. So it's not something that you learn and you know, you're constantly learning more. On top of that, he's handsome, he's fit, because he likes CrossFit, he likes good food, he likes good music, he loves traveling with his family. So, you know, personally, I just love the man. Uh, we have very similar interests, I suspect. And he's gonna talk about uh, his specialty, but as an outline for the whole day, um, I'm going to present the problem of low back pain and talk briefly about what are some of the causes, what the traditional treatments are, what the advanced treatments are, that's the topic of today. Uh, and Dr. Darrington will then talk about PRP and stem cells, among other things, just in general the field of orthobiologics, kind of again this advanced treatment strategy. And then that's considered non-operative treatment, then I'll finish with um, surgical treatment options that are in this category of advanced treatment, specifically the laser endoscopic spine surgery technique. So with that, um, let me get started with, and, and then at the end, we'll leave time for Q&A. Having said that, please use the chat feature of your Zoom. So if you look at the very bottom of your Zoom, there's something that says chat. If you click on that, it'll open up a little side window and you can type in comments and questions. And then while I'm talking, Dr. Darrington will uh, look at the uh, chats and your questions and comments. So will Brittany, who's, I don't think you can see her, but she's the one that made all this happen. So yay, Brittany. And please interrupt us so that we know you're not falling asleep or checking your email while we're talking. Um, but at the very end, we'll just have an open Q&A session. So hopefully lots of Q&A during the presentations and then dedicated Q&A afterwards. And if I could, I would ask you guys questions, but I don't think I can. So let me just start out by explaining the problem the way I see it. And it's this problem of what I call nagging low back pain. It's not the kind of low back pain that puts you in a wheelchair. It's the kind of low back pain that a lot of my colleagues have. And it turns out this type of back pain is unbelievably common 
because 75% of us will have it at some point. I just had a big flare up a week ago and I'm walking around like an old man, but don't tell anybody. But it's so common, um, either you yourself have it or you know somebody that have it. Most of the time, these bouts of low back pain improves with kind of time and non-operative treatment measures, etc. So even though it's common, for most people it gets better over time. But that doesn't mean everybody gets better. There's a small proportion of patients whose pain becomes chronic. And for those patients, it's 100%. And those are the type of patients that we're talking about. It turns out it is the second most common reason for medical office visits, only second to like a common cold complaint. And it's the number one cause of work-related disability. Uh, and that's kind of a big deal. So when we're talking about low back pain, where does it come from is probably the most important question from the standpoint of treatment. Because if you know where something, where something is coming from, you can start thinking about reasonable ways to treat it. If you don't know where it's coming from, the treatment usually doesn't go very well. So here's a telling figure that illustrates for me the problem at hand. So if you look at a pie chart of all the different causes of back pain, this is like something that physicians look at. So from a physician standpoint, if you look at all the causes, the largest cause, this cause right uh, that shows that's showing up in this huge dark blue area, we call that nonspecific low back pain. So if you don't have cancer or compression fracture or ankylosing spondylitis, spinal stenosis, disc herniation, something obvious and big, um, your nonspecific low back pain. In other words, like we're not going to look for the treatment very hard because we don't know where it's coming from. That's the thinking. Um, and you can see why that is a problem because if that's the majority of the causes of low back pain, we are ignoring the majority of patients that have this problem. That's just the way I see it. So if you really dig deep and just ask yourself, because that's what I have to do when I take care of patients with low back pain, is to ask, where is it coming from? So the first question is, anatomically, where is it coming from? It be, could be coming from a few different anatomic sites like the disc, the muscles, the tendons and ligaments, and the bones. Those are the kind of categories of pain generators. Um, in other words, areas that can cause pain. The majority of these things, the pain can get better with non-operative treatment, focusing on activity modification, physical therapy, exercise, and the body has an incredible capacity to heal on its own. And that's when we say, just give it some time. It's not time, it's giving your body an opportunity to kind of readjust, accommodate, and basically heal itself. But that is not successful every time. So there's a group of patients who don't get better and who still need treatment. When it, if it's muscle, ligaments, and bones, there's not much you can do about it unless the bones are fractured, for example. But if you have a disc problem, there's lots of treatments, and that's what I want to focus on is the disc problems as an anatomic cause of back pain. So if you have a disc problem that's causing chronic low back pain, how do we treat this? And the treatment, if you just categorize it into these big buckets. It's either medical management. The majority of us go through that. Some people will include pain management in there, but I think pain management has its own category because they're doing so many cool new things that they should be in its own category. That's things like targeted injections, dorsal column stimulators, PRP, stem cells, orthobiologics, etc. In addition to the medical management that pain physicians uh, provide they also provide these kind of procedures so that's why it's in a category because it's not exactly surgery it's all needle based and percutaneous and then finally there's surgery and there's multiple different levels of surgery so if you just take all those three treatment categories you can also subdivide them into two other categories these are kind of artificial but this is in my mind why you're all here there's traditional treatment this is the kind of the treatment that you get every day um, and it's great treatment if you, if anybody says in the U.S., if you get really sick, we are the best healthcare facility. If you're really sick, if you're really healthy, we're not so good. But if you get really sick, we have the top-notch uh, medical care. But it's it's not that great for people that have this non-specific low back pain. Traditional treatment. I think we've all heard of PT, chiropractic care, exercise, activity modification, over-the-counter medications and maybe epidural steroid injections. But turns out, there's a whole nother category of treatments 
that fall outside of traditional treatment, and this is a huge category, but I'm just going to focus on a very small proportion that that um, is not so far out there that it's experimental, even though maybe insurance companies will consider it investigational. It's that treatment in the middle between traditional tried and true treatment and experimental treatment. And these are a whole group of new treatments that have been around for a long time and not everybody knows how to provide that treatment and not everybody thinks it should be paid for. That's a separate issue, but it's this advanced treatment that um, that we want to focus on. So the non-operative treatment part that I want to focus on are PRP injections and stem cell injections. Dr. Darrington is an expert in that and he will educate us on um, that treatment uh, option and then I will talk about the endoscopic surgery option as a surgical option and before you even decide on the treatment it's important to kind of understand why an annular tear is an annular tear and why it's a problem so starting out with what is an annular tear it is simply a step in the process where a normal disc that you're born with and that you have until you're about I don't know 15 or 16 slowly starts undergoing the, the process of degeneration, which occurs through a combination of you know, subacute injuries, that's like living life hard, and just everyday living. It's like the treads on your tire are wearing out. Uh, it will wear out even if you drive really slow. It'll wear out faster if you drive really hard. But between a normal disc and a completely degenerated disc, there is something right in the middle, and the process starts with these tears in the outer part of the disc called the annulus and this is what the disc looks like. So if you just look at the figure on the left, that is a normal disc space. So the disc has two parts. This is a gross oversimplification, but it has a central gelatinous core in red called the nucleus. It is the gel that basically acts like the shock absorber. And imagine a jelly donut, that's the jelly. It is surrounded by a thick border or ring of crisscrossing collagen fibers that's like a leather belt or a steel belt or radial tire. It's very thick um, and it occupies probably almost half of the disc space all told, but it holds in the nucleus in a way. And then on the outside of the annulus, this diagram isn't perfect, on the outside rimming the surface of the annulus are all the little nerves that act like pain sensors, position sensors, and allows your brain to monitor position, stress, and injury within that disc space. So over time, in just repetitive living life in one G of gravity, that's planet Earth, will cause injury to this annulus and slowly make it wear down, and you can develop a tear. And in that tear, the nucleus can basically get inside there, get trapped, and when that happens, the body recognizes it as an injury and initiates a healing response and basically heals it. And for most of us, that process undergoes um, a start, a middle, and an end, and turns off once it's done. And that annular tear may have been symptomatic, but it's just temporary and you get better. But every once in a while, that healing response goes awry, and instead of going start, middle, end, it gets stuck somewhere in the middle, especially in the inflammatory process of healing. So all healing goes through the inflammatory process, which turns on and turns off, all healing. But every once in a while, the inflammatory process gets confused and it does not turn off and it just stays on and it's self-perpetuating. We see that all the time in diseases like tennis elbow, golfer's elbow, plantar fasciitis slash heel pain, greater trochanteric bursitis tendonitis, rotator cuff tendonitis, and I can go on and on and on. And if anybody's had any of those conditions, I'm sure you'll admit to a few things. Number one, they are painful. I had golfer's elbow and I've been punched in the face, I broke in my wrist, I blew up my ACL. When I had golfer's elbow, there were periods where I couldn't even sleep at night because it, it started to ache so bad. And it lasted for like over a year, almost two years. Same thing with my rotator cuff tendonitis. It hurt me for almost two years. It's really frustrating. And my hypothesis is that the group of patients that have these annular tear injuries to their spine, to their disc, that it becomes chronic and don't get better, they get stuck in this process of inflammation and non-healing. Um, and that's the problem that we're probably trying to treat in 
the majority of patients that have this nagging low back pain. And if your MRI looks anything like this, this is what an annular tear looks like on MRI. It's called an HIZ, high intensity zone, because it's bright. This is what a normal disc looks like right here and right there, or right here and right there. And right here is the annular tear. And the diagram to the right kind of just illustrates that all these little nerve uh, endings turn on and imagine this leaking out intermittently uh, over time, self-perpetuating this healing process and causing chronic inflammation. And that's no different than a tennis elbow, but it's in your back and it can be very painful. So if that is your hypothesis as to what the problem is, now we can start thinking about ways to treat it. It's just sheer logic. You need to know what the problem is to fix it. Now that we have a hypothesis of what the problem is, then it seems reasonable to start thinking about treatments. And I still believe in traditional treatments. You should all do that. So here's a person. I bet you it's not unlike many people that are out there. He's a tech engineer, so he sits a lot. He's busy. He's in an upper trajectory in his career. But he's had this chronic back pain for three years. He's working full time for an awesome company. But he can't sit for very long, and he's a tech engineer. He sits most of the day. Um, on days where I'm sitting at my computer doing like paperwork, working on talks, I'm the same way. My back is really bothersome. I fidget. I have a hard time concentrating for long periods of time, and I'm not the funnest person to be around. I'm kind of cranky. So a person like this maybe will not play golf that much because it doesn't seem that fun anymore, and they certainly will go would not go to happy hour to meet all their friends at the end of a long workday because they just want to go home and lay down. In other words, they are just, fun they're happy, they're functional, but they're not very happy. And let's face it, life is short to live your entire life kind of miserable and cranky with this low-lying, low back pain that's preventing you from really taking life by, with both hands and, and living it to its maximum, just kind of getting by. That is not a very good situation and and I can see how if you have cancer or an infection this is not that big of a problem but if this is you it's a huge problem <laughs> and it's like an, a frog in boiling water you don't necessarily know that the water is boiling you to death you just sit there and just go huh why is my life so miserable so this person's MRI looks like this you got an annular tear there and they've tried activity modification that's another fancy way of saying don't have fun and don't uh, um, uh, do anything like golf or, or sightseeing and doing fun things with your friends. Change your workstation ergonomics. Um, we should all do that. They've tried physical therapy, exercise, chiropractic care, massage. I love massage. They've even tried medications and even epidural steroid injections. And this patient's still not better. This is such a common problem uh, because the underlying problem is so common. So now what? Traditionally, this is what we've been treating, how we've been treating these patients. Either we just say, just do the best you can. Don't call us, we'll call you. Basically, uh, kind of, we don't call it ignoring the patient. <laughs> we call it something different that's medical. I can't even remember the term. Um, I think it's called expectant management. We just hope that it doesn't get horribly worse because if it does get horribly worse, come back and we'll do a fusion. And the vast majority of people will not do the F word. They just are too scared of that surgery. And they should be because it's a big surgery. I do a lot of fusions, but not for discogenic low back pain because um, it's not a very good operation for that and it's too big of an operation. So we, not, we need to start thinking of new ways to treat this problem because up until now, we've been kind of ignoring this group of patients um, and there's a lot of them. And I'm, I know a lot of these people. So with that, I would like to talk about the first set of advanced treatments that are non-operative, PRP injections and stem cells. Um, I've been talking for way more than 10 minutes, but I'd like to use this opportunity to introduce again, Dr. Darrington, who will give us a presentation on this. Um, and then I'll give a, a brief presentation on the surgery and then we'll have lots of Q&A. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing and let Dr. Darrington share his screen so he can share all his knowledge with us. Go ahead, Dr. Darrington. We good? I see it. Perfect. All right. 
Thank you so much for that uh, intro. That was awesome. Um, I'm not sure I could have said it better myself, but I would have echoed a lot of the same things you were talking about. Um, like you said, discogenic back pain is kind of this, you get stuck in the closet until things get worse where there's a, a bigger problem and then you do a big over the top surgery for it. And, you know, for, like you said, a lot of people, the conservative things, time, uh, physical therapy, uh, all that stuff helps for most people, but there's that population that it doesn't. And, and this is really where I think there are a lot of really great options uh, available now, which is very fortunate. Um, a little bit about my training. Uh, Dr. K uh, Kim already went over that a little bit. Um, so you know, disc injuries here, like you mentioned, what usually happens is you have a tear in this annulus here on the outside part of the disc. And the inside part can push on this and either give you irritating um, the outside ring here, giving you pain just in the back. But as the example that Dr. Kim mentioned, you can get leg pain from that too, either from part of this disc actually pushing on the nerve, or sometimes it's just some of those irritating chemicals that can transiently irritate the nerve, especially when you do things that put pressure on the disc, like sitting or bending or reaching or lifting. Um, and, and this is that situation where the patient can still be alive and do some things, but they really aren't doing the things that they want to do. Um, so as you mentioned, lots of conservative treatment options, and usually the interventional injection-based treatments in the past have always been just cortisone steroid epidural injections. And you kind of do those until they stop working. Sometimes they never work at first, and then you kind of go, well, wait until it's time for a fusion. Um, and fortunately, there are some um, less invasive options that are available now, but oftentimes, I'm sure Dr. Kim has seen these patients uh, from other providers, and they say, well, my back still hurts. It didn't fix my back pain because these kind of fusion surgeries don't really work for discogenic low back pain. Um, so getting into the orthobiologics, which is basically a fancy way to talk about things that are coming from your body to treat uh, the orthopedic system. Here we're talking mostly about the spine uh, and a couple of different orthobiologic treatments that are used include using bone marrow from your pelvis or using PRP or platelet rich plasma. Um, now, platelet-rich plasma is basically utilizing the growth factors from inside your platelets to initiate a healing response and modulating inflammation. And the bone marrow cells uh, are also doing a similar thing um, in, in, that, uh, in that case where you're injecting it. So here's just an example of over here on the right, uh, the picture the, in the middle, that's uh, some concentrated bone marrow uh, from a patient's pelvis. And then on the left and on the right are different versions of PRP that we're using uh, different places in this patient. But these are just picture examples of an x-ray picture showing the needles being directed into the middle of those discs to help heal those annular tears. Um, now, as Dr. Kim mentioned, this is a field that is uh, new, but it's been around for a while, um, probably 20 years or so of good data uh, with these kind of treatments using PRP and bone marrow. Um, but it's a pretty challenging field to, to be good at. It takes a lot of training, uh, a lot of expertise, and you have to know how to use the right equipment and the right tools correctly. And you also need to know who to pick for what procedures. Patient selection and identifying what the problem is uh, is a very important part of this. Um, now I'm going to go quickly through, because I know these kind of charts are not very exciting, but um, there's a couple different um, you know, pretty well-respected uh, articles that have come out in the last several years, especially talking about outcomes after these kind of procedures. So this is following patients for a couple of years after getting PRP injections into their back for discogenic pain. And this top one, actually I'll zoom in because the next one is a closer look, but this functional rating index is basically a series of questions asking patients how they can function, how they can do normal things like sitting and standing and reaching and driving. And you can see as we go further out towards the right, that, that number keeps going down, which is a positive thing. You, they're having a better level of function. And their ability through a different way to check their function has gone up on the blue line, on the, on the orange line, their pain has improved as well. By the way, everyone, um, please use the chat to type in any comments and questions so that we can also, I'll, I'm happy to interrupt Dr. Darrington with questions and also answer some questions directly onto the chat. So 
Um, uh, and I see one here actually um, that was posted a couple of minutes ago asking about the difference between an annular tear and a bulging disc. We'll talk about it at the end. Good question. Perfect. Uh, so here's a couple of cool pictures here uh, showing patients, the same patient at different time points. So on the left here, this is their MRI where you look at them from the side and then kind of slices through their middle. You see bright white right there. That's that annular tear we were talking about. Another bright white in the middle here and some of this disc material going backwards uh, over here on the left side. Uh, they tried several traditional steroid epidural injections and those didn't change and the patient didn't feel any better. But after injections of uh, PRP into their disc, that bright white spot went away here, went away there and went away there. So that's showing that that annular tear actually healed with injections of PRP into their disc. Uh, now these patients, as I showed you on the slides before, also had significant improvements in their pain and in their function. Uh, another study looking in this one, bone marrow uh, stem cells, and this is following patients for three years and just quickly kind of talking about it, um, a way to measure their disability, their, basically how well they can function and their pain scores all got better over time. And one thing that's interesting about this, they looked at those who had some stem cells and those who had more stem cells and above a certain number, they saw a difference in how these patients did. Both groups did well compared to before injections, but they did better if they had more stem cells. So if you have the ability to have processing that can concentrate these cells more, that's probably going to give you a better outcome than if they can't pro if they can't concentrate it as much. And you see most of these patients, 80% of all the patients avoided having surgery at 36 months after the injections. And here's another one showing changes in their pain scores. This top line here, the maximum amount of pain the average amount of pain and the minimal amount of pain. And you see, as we go from before treatment to a year and a half later, these numbers have all come down significantly. And medication use went down significantly as well for 80% of those patients, which is huge because medications and the whole opioid crisis, uh, you know, those are significant issues that people dealing with pain, unfortunately, are oftentimes involved with. Uh, and here's just one of my patients that, uh, shared this with me uh, and really everybody on his Instagram. Uh, and he's a, he's a couple, he's almost, I think three years out now, but he's a retired NFL football player, uh, used to have just chronic back issues, would always be, he was telling me he would spend one day a week just laying down doing basically nothing because his training required him to do enough that would just constantly give him back problems. And he's been, he's been doing all kinds of crazy things um, since I've treated him and it's made a huge change in his life. Um, now, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, a different kind of back problem as well. So that more degenerative disc disease that Dr. Kim mentioned earlier and all the different components of the back that can that can cause pain in patients where it's not mostly coming from the disc, there is multiple factors and that nonspecific generalized low back pain is usually a combination of those several different structures. So the discs and the facet joints themselves also, and the ligaments and the muscles are all part of how our back is supposed to work. And when you have an injury to one or multiple of those areas, it affects how that all uh, comes together and how we're able to function. So uh, these are just a couple of quick pictures of a facet injection here, where you see a, a space here where there's no contrast and that's filling up that, that facet joint. Here is a facet joint in the neck being injected. These are a couple ligament injections. Uh, Dr. Kim actually showed a picture of the iliolumbar ligament being injured in one of his earlier pictures. And this is an injection of the iliolumbar ligament as part of this treatment. And these are examples of epidural injections as well, not using steroids, but using a version of PRP. And as we look at registry data that the organization I'm involved with has been collecting for a long time, these generalized low back pain patients when you just treat part of the area, they can get some improvement, but it's not very significant. These little blue dots, these ask these stars here, these are important because as we add more areas, you see these numbers getting better and better and more stars 
throughout the two years that this is following patients. And this study just came out uh, a month or so ago, looking at this whole functional spinal unit approach for neck patients. And um, their uh, pain scores are getting better here as we follow over 24 months. Their pain scores through a different measure are improving here as well. And this bottom number here, this bottom graph here is important because just because your number goes from uh, a, a six to a four, that may or may not be significant, but these questionnaires have what's called a minimally clinically important difference. So who cares if your pain is less if it doesn't allow you to do more things. But this is showing that as we get, especially up to six months and beyond, 60, 70, even 80% of patients are having significant changes in their pain. They're having significant changes in their function. And um, yeah, so, I mean, these are things that we can make changes on, not only those discogenic pain coming from the disc itself, as, but also to those more complex uh, patients that are not ready for fusion, but have this chronic nagging low back pain that um, you know doesn't seem to be getting better with anything that you're trying. There's a bunch of questions that we can't wait anymore. All right, I'm, so, I'm, I'm ready. So Dr. Kim, I guess uh, to Yeah, let's stop then... share. Can you stop sharing? And then let me ask you some questions that have been coming up. Go for it. Number one. I'm scrolling up here, I see this. Oh, okay. Where do you want to start? There's one that I wanted to ask about. Um, does PRP assist in increasing disc height over time? And also just a lot of people ask me that. Will it reinflate the disc? So if you can talk about if it does that and whether or not that's important clinically, yeah. um, I'll be useful. So, yeah, most of the research has not shown increases in disc height. Sometimes you might see little changes. Uh, more and more research is showing that it can actually brighten up the disc a little bit. Uh, this is kind of getting into some nuances, but as discs degenerate, they go from a really bright white and tall disc to a darker and flatter disc. Uh, and after these treatments, some of the patients we're seeing that disc is just a little bit brighter, um, which can be indicative that it's having some better hydration and it's probably functioning better. Uh, so it's not going to pump up a flat disc, especially the, the more flat discs they get these kind of intradiscal PRP stem cell procedures tend to struggle a little bit more just because this process is more advanced. Uh, so as I mentioned before, patient selection is very important. Um, so picking the patients that are gonna respond well to the right kind of treatment is an important part of that, um, but it's not going to you know, fix your flat tire and completely pump it back up. All right, and we've also been talking about PRP and stem cells, but they're two totally different things. Yeah. PRP is a blood product. Stem cells is actually living tissue, living cells um, taken from an area of the body where you have like really immature cells that can differentiate into anything. So do they, how do they work? And do they work in a similar mechanism of action or are they two totally different? They're, there's, they're, they're kind of on a spectrum. Strategies. You can think about it as a spectrum. And, and one of the interesting things is um, I saw some data recently that intradiscal PRP and bone marrow, both can be very helpful. This is in the same study group here. So sometimes you can't draw conclusions from different studies, but, um, but basically the outcomes were very similar for intradiscal PRP as was intradiscal concentrated bone marrow stem cells. So like you mentioned, PRP is concentrating the platelets and we're using the growth factors and basically the cell signaling from inside those platelets to initiate a healing response. With the bone marrow you're using various cells some of these are mesenchymal stem cells there's all kinds of other cells in this mixture that are concentrated and they have the ability to turn into different cells um, but both can be very helpful for um, for these kind of annular tears in the disc do you have a favorite uh in younger patients they i mean Young people just, as I think as we know, they recover from all kinds of injuries very, very fast. So uh, oftentimes younger patients can do well with PRP. As patients get a little bit older, you may want something a little bit stronger if you want to think of it like that. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I think that there's somewhat of a divide there to an extent. Um, That's interesting kind of because that brings us case. to another interesting question that somebody asked. 
which was related to your age. So they said something like, well, I can't remember, but does it matter what your age is? It sounds like it kind of does. Well, it, can you it talk can about that? It, it can a little bit, uh, I think, as far as what you're choosing to use. Um, but you know, one of the interesting things with some of the registry data that I was talking about, a lot of these procedures, whether it's spine or whether it's other body areas that I treat, we see people of older age still responding well. Um, one of the things specifically for treating knees with like with concentrated bone marrow stem cells, uh, as long as numbers of those cells are above a certain number, most of those patients do well. There's obviously a lot of other factors that could be playing into that. Um, but there's, you know, part of this question oftentimes comes up because they may have been to a seminar or they've given to another clinic where they're using some kind of non product from you using umbilical amniotic stem cells that they're oftentimes called. Now, a lot of them are rebranding the marketing as, uh, exosomes, or there's all kinds of, of, you know, nice, fancy ways to talk about this. But the reality is those cells in the, or those products in the United States don't have live stem cells in them. This has been proven by several different um, universities around the country, UC Davis, Cornell. So you're, the, so you're distinguishing between autologous stem cells, yes. that's orthobiologics, that's where you take the stem cells from the patient and then give it back to the patient after whatever you do. Exactly. Yeah. So I'm, I'm talking cells. about autologous treatments and you can also get stem cells from other donors, either umbilical stem cells that have been grown up in tissue culture. Right. Well, and then given to you like like tissue from the bone from a tissue bank. Right. That's, yeah. So um, that that's that's not allowed allograft. in the United States. Yeah. So those kind of culturally expanded umbilical or other tissue sources from somebody else those products aren't allowed or that kind of processing is not allowed in the United States. So any of the umbilical or amniotic or other things that are, that are, uh, that are not from you, uh, they're not processed that same way. And, and it's not yet FDA approved. Correct. That's yeah. the issue. Okay. Yeah. So most people that ask for stem cells, they can expect to get autologous stem cells from their own body. They, they inject should, it back they into should, them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That would be the, okay. That's the most yeah. common. And, and one um, of the questions I see here that might have just popped up about older versus younger, 41 is not considered old. Uh, I'm happy to say that because I'm right behind you, but uh, 41 is not old in the, uh, you know, can I still heal? Um, this is, again, one of those things that I've heard over and over from patients who have been to, like I said, seminars and other clinics where they're said, your cells are too old. It's not going to work. Use these fresh, young, vibrant cells, which, like I said, they're not even alive, first of all. And there's been studies that have been, uh, there's one that's like in uh, publishing right now, looking at several of these products to see if they can actually be plated on culture cells and, and grown and they don't grow, but 50, 60, 70, even 80 year old patients. And when you, when you put their bone marrow cells in there, they grow like crazy. Wow. Um, so it, you have it a, a pretty incredible ability to heal. Even as we get older, we may need a little more encouragement as we get older, um, but it's not something that just shuts off as we, uh, you know, as we hit our middle ages. All right, we have a bunch more questions, but in the interest of time, let me talk about the laser endoscopic surgery as a treatment, and then we'll have time to just have open-ended questions that could be either both operative and non-operative. And uh, um, so, let me, so stand by. Let me pull up my portion of the talk. So um, thank you, Dr. Darrington. That was really insightful. I learned a bunch of that stuff too, um, especially the treatment of multiple things at once because uh, I did leave out facet joints in there specifically because I didn't want to talk about facet joints, but that is an important component of a pain generator. Uh, and that speaks to treating, sometimes you need to treat all the problems uh, yeah. together to actually get a meaningful outcome. Um, all right, so staying focused on the disc, you have a disc problem, you've tried traditional treatments, you've tried um, PRP and stem cell injections, and you're still not doing well, and now you're at a point where you're thinking about surgery, and that's what I wanted to talk about because um, up until recently, we did not have a good surgical treatment. It was one of those situations where we either uh, ignored you surgically and just let you live with it like this, 
or wait for you to get bad enough to have a big surgery like a fusion or a disc replacement, which are massive operations that when they go well, it's great, but it's like driving 100 miles on the freeway. If you get into a crash at 100 miles an hour, it can be bad. So you don't want to drive 100 miles an hour all the time, even though you get home really fast. You want to save that for when you really need to drive 100 miles an hour. So that's where I come in because I love Formula One. So let me start out with this presentation right here. Can I see what you're looking at? I have a dual screen monitor. That's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. Okay, so when it comes to surgery, what are our treatments kind of in the category of um, advanced treatments? So it's not fusion surgery. Even though I do my fusions minimally invasively, a small, a minimally invasive fusion is still not a small operation, it's a big operation. So until recently, we didn't have any treatments until I stumbled upon the laser endoscopic surgery, which I've been doing for a very long time for the typical discectomy surgeries, which is for a herniated disc, you know, a big disc herniation that is physically compressing the nerve and causing pain shooting down your leg that we call sciatica or radiculopathy. You know, we usually do a microdiscectomy or a laminectomy. That's not the patient that I'm talking about. I'm talking about this annular tear patient with back pain plus or minus radiculitis. And when I started doing endoscopic surgery for the herniated disc patients, I also noticed that their back pain got a lot better, even more so than when I did microdiscectomy and laminectomy surgery, and to a certain extent, even with fusion surgery. So um, I'm not the first one to show this. There's been people that show the endoscopic surgery works well for this annular back pain, and that's what I want to talk about. So what is it in terms of treatment? It falls into this category of advanced treatments in the surgical uh, treatment options, and it's designed to treat this lesion right here. And this is kind of what it looks like. You start out by making a little poke hole, and instead of making a big incision and looking down to see what you're doing, you use a combination of intraoperative imaging and small little starting instruments to get you to exactly where you need to go to before you make the incision. So it's a backwards way of exposing the surgical corridor. So like a traditional surgeon, which I used to be, I'm trained as a traditional open surgeon, you you create the surgical corridor and then find the surgical target site. In minimal invasive surgery, it's sometimes the opposite. You get to the surgical target site and then you open up the surgical corridor around that center target site. And now you do things like using the spaghetti noodle dilator, little straws that get bigger and bigger and bigger, and intraoperative imaging. So I'm almost like, like an interventional radiologist. So this is how you advance a little instrument like that and put it exactly at the surgical target site. And once you get it there, you make it a little bit bigger. Now first, I stick a little needle in there and I inject dye into the middle of the disc and watch it leak out. It's a blue dye when you look, and it'll be important when I show you how, uh, how it looks under the endoscope, because everything looks the same. And you can see right now this center little dark spot. It's gonna get bigger. Let me back that up, I apologize. So if you look here, there's a little needle right there and I'm injecting this dye into the middle of the disc and it starts to leak out the back. And on the next slide, I removed a bunch. You can see a little shadow right there at the back of the annulus. And you can really see it right there. That corresponds to the annular tear on MRI. And when I see that, I think to myself, okay, we're doing well so far. And this is even before I make the incision. And then I advance that little spaghetti noodle dilator and then, I don't know if you can see this little, slightly bigger sleeve. That goes down, then a slightly bigger sleeve, then a slightly bigger sleeve, then a slightly bigger sleeve, until you put in the cannula. And you can just see it getting bigger and bigger. And once you put the cannula down, you take everything from the inside out, and now you've got a tube that you could stick an endoscope in. And this is no different than a knee arthroscopy, or a shoulder arthroscopy, or laparoscopic cholecystectomy. You use little channels to put down a camera and you look up onto a TV screen. So here's the first look at something like this and 
it's greatly magnified. It's underwater, so it's washing out everything. And you can really see things way more clearly than if you just look at it with the naked eye, because it's bigger and it's constantly cleared away of all the blood. So that's me just showing myself everything. And now I've got, and I'm looking on the TV screen for this. This is like watching TV or playing a video game. I stank at video games as a kid, so go figure. And now I'm just slowly teasing away all the tissues that are in my way, all the while knowing that there's something scary on the other side. Because my mama always said spine surgery would be a lot easier without blood vessels and nerves. So one of the tricks that I do is by injecting that blue dye, look what happens when I start taking peaks into the canal where all the pathology is. There's a little blue area that tells me that is the disc. It cannot be the nerve because sometimes everything looks like a nerve under the endoscope. So by looking down and seeing something that is different in terms of color, I immediately know where I am in terms of three-dimensional anatomy because it can be very confusing. So I'm just sitting here going on and on and on, just picking away at this like I would if there was gum and shag carpet, all the while taking extreme care to avoid injuring the nerve. I can't even see the nerve right now. The disc protrusion is that little blue thing and there's a flap of loose outer part of the disc that you'll see flapping in and out. This is getting really boring, so I'm gonna forward to the next slide. And now I've got this little ball tip feeler that's curved and I'm moving things around. I, you can see I've removed some of that yellow tissue there's still a thin layer of tissue over what I call the dural tube. And of course, the bleeding makes it really annoying. And now I'm using the candida to rotate it. And I'm using it like a pimple popper. It's kind of gross, but that's what it's like. And you can see this blue disc material starting to emanate out of that opening and create more and more space. It's oddly gratifying sometimes. And now you can see me pulling those pieces out. And sometimes they just come flying out all on their own. And what an annular tear usually entails is you have that thick annulus where inside all the cracks and fissures is stuck inside there this bluish gelatinous nucleus material that's trapped inside there. And that nucleus material is what activates our body to tell it that there's an injury and to mount a healing response, which almost always involves inflammation. So here I am doing another little trick. I'm using this cannula like a pimple popper again. So it's this kind of teasing away of these disc fragments. It's very different than open surgery. That's why it's really hard for spine surgeons to convert from traditional open surgery to endoscopic surgery because it's sort of like being a skier and trying to learn how to snowboard. You can be an excellent skier. You're not going to be an excellent snowboarder right away. You'll be better than somebody that doesn't know how to ski but you'll still have to go through a really steep learning curve. And this is one of the biggest problems with endoscopic surgery. That opening is the size of my big pen. And so it's very tedious um, and in some ways very time consuming. We save a lot of time on closing the incision because there's nothing to close. So most of the time we're, is used to find the pathology and treat the pathology. And you can see why more, more, more spine surgeons don't do the surgery. It is annoying. It is tedious. You have to like building ships in a bottle, you like, you have to like taking gum out of shag carpet. I hate both of those things, but I can't help myself. And then here's the laser. Everyone asks, what do you use the laser for? The laser is just one of many instruments that we use to do the surgery. And because the surgical corridor is so narrow, you need all different kinds of instruments that you wouldn't typically need. So the laser is, uh, you don't need the laser. It's just a luxury in the surgery because it allows you to ablate tissue, and hopefully you can see this now. And it's non-electrical, so think about this. The nerve does not like getting electrocuted. <laughs> so when you use that other probe that was blue, that's an electrical instrument. There are many instruments that we use that are electrical that's used to cauterize blood vessels and shrink tissue. The laser is not electrical. It's mechanical, believe it or not. So you can get right up next to the nerve without shocking it because there's no conduction. It's all mechanical. So if you put the laser right on the nerve, yes, it will be bad because lasers can cut metal and concrete too, just like a scalpel, but you can work right next to it with precision much more safely than an electrical instrument. So I'm literally working half a millimeter away from the nerve right now. I could not do that with an electrical instrument. And sometimes even mechanical instruments can be dangerous to use. So this is just 
one of many different tools that I pull out of my toolbox uh, and utilize depending on the scenario. That's the Elman Probe, it's electrical, so it's sort of like golf. You need, the, you need the putter, you need the driver, and you need a wedge, as well as your irons. And at the end of the case... This is all done, it went perfectly through that little poke hole, and now I'm gonna put on... This is what you get. The world's most expensive band-aid, because it's a hospital band-aid, but I found all the badness. I am so confident you're gonna do better. So we're all wishing you a robust and speedy recovery. Right, guys? Yeah! Surgery's all done. It went perfectly through the... Okay, and then, this doesn't happen with everybody, but this happens a lot. You get something like this a few days later, and let's face it, can't help but make you smile when somebody says that. So with that, thank you. I have lots more videos on my YouTube channel, so if you're bored and can't get to sleep tonight, really good for insomnia. And with that, thank you. And now would be a perfect time to open it up to, to Q&A for everybody. Except I'm having some crazy, weird things on my video. <laughs> How are you doing over there? It's fine. Okay, it's just me. So I'm going to pull up the chat. And let's go over more questions until 6 o'clock. All right, so that was a question that uh, was both for me and Dr. Darrington. So, Dr. Darrington, what is the recovery time of a PRP or stem cell injection? Is there a recovery time? And when do you start to see the effects of the procedure? Is it immediate or does it take time for the body to kind of go through a healing yeah, process? Good question. It kind of depends. Like, like I said, I kind of talked about two different types of treatments. If we're talking about injecting into the disc, there's oftentimes a week or two where the pain is actually increased. So things that normally would bother you like sitting or reaching are gonna be uncomfortable. Um, but typically after that period of time, things really start to calm down and improve and get better. And uh, if we're talking about that functional spinal unit injection of epidural ligaments, facets, that usually is actually uh, a better recovery. Typically it's two or three days where your back is a little bit stiff and sore and achy kind of feels full um and that typically responds uh it's not as significant of the discomfort that you would have after the injection into the disc uh and then that calms down uh, pretty quickly uh and then when things start to feel better kind of depends on what we're treating uh but anywhere from a couple day a couple weeks to maybe a couple months uh, most people are feeling some kind if not significant improvement by three or four months perfect well, and then the same question with surgery, it's variable from person to person, but the endoscopic surgery, the closest counterpart in traditional open surgery is the microdiscectomy, which turns out to be one of the best surgeries that we do for herniated discs. So um, I would say that a typical microdiscectomy patient takes like two, three, four weeks to recover. Um, but again, everyone's a little bit different. Some people recover like that and other people take months. But the equivalent patient after an endoscopic surgery, instead of two, three, four weeks, it's more like two, three, four days. Um, so I think this, the size of the incision, as well as the fact that we don't do much bony work, and combined with the fact that it's under constant irrigation, I think makes a huge difference in terms of the post-operative inflammatory process. So um, another huge advantage of the endoscopic surgery is, compared to other spine surgeries, a very, very rapid recovery. Uh, most patients, I would say over half, don't even take any of the narcotic pain medicines, um, which for every one of my other patients and every one of my other surgeries, um, they have to take pain medicines at least for a few days. Okay, what other questions do we have? Okay, I have a lot of questions. There's a bunch of questions from people that have had multiple surgeries and I think they probably all also have hardware and they have continued pain. Is there anything that, that's not very good for endoscopic surgery um, unless you have problems due to an adjacent level problem. Um, but my guess is that most of the patients have what we call post-laminectomy syndrome. The surgery itself has caused so much trauma, there's a tons of scar tissue. If you have hardware, that hardware can be symptomatic. Um, 
So my guess is that most of the revision patients have kind of a post-laminectomy syndrome kind of problem. Um, how does PRP and stem cell treatments, are they any good at addressing patients like that? It's a similar situation like you were saying. If it's in that same surgical area, it's, it's challenging because especially if they've had laminectomy infusion, some of the places where I would be injecting aren't accessible or have been removed or it's, it's, the anatomy is different. That adjacent segment disease, as you brought up, is something that, as I'm sure a lot of people that are listening know, you know, tends to happen over longer periods of time after having single level, multi-level fusions. Uh, and those can be addressed with these same kind of treatments. Um, but obviously the, you know, the biomechanics of the whole spine is different when you start restricting movement at one area uh, and just overstresses. And that's why that tends to happen over time. Okay. We're running out of time, three more minutes, but um, there was a question that I was just about to ask you. Can PRP be used to treat chronic? No, that's not the one. That's on hamstrings. The answer is yes, by the way, on hamstrings. Yeah. Oh, here it is. This is a little off topic, but uh, this is the second person that's asked me. One person in, uh, put on the chat that they got treated with doxycycline mm -hmm. to treat low back pain, and then separately somebody post uh, commented on the chat that there's recent research suggesting that a cause of disc pain can be an imbalance in the bacterial flora in our discs, similar to how our gut flora can get out of balance and can be improved with antibiotics. I yeah, know a little bit about my, that. That was actually my response. About that? that was my response to, uh, to Shoab. That's a oh, great that question. Okay. And yeah, so there, it's really interesting. I mean, we're, yeah, I think, well, I don't know who's, who's, if you're not in the medical field, if you're familiar, but, you know, people getting like C. diff infections where you have these really bad gastrointestinal problems can happen from having too many antibiotics and that balance of the right kind of bacteria uh, in our gut being out of whack can cause that kind of problem. There's, you know, more and more research showing that that can cause other things outside of your gut. And there was a paper that came out, I believe, two years ago that when they were doing another spine surgery, actually, I think it was patients, I think it was uh, post-mortem. So these patients had passed from some other cause. They took samples of healthy looking discs and degenerated discs. And there was a very different profile of, of bacteria in those discs. There was, there was bacteria in normal healthy discs. Um, and there was a, pre, a different study that actually gave antibiotics, um, I believe just orally, uh, for patients with back pain and it got better, like, uh, like this person mentioned. So there may be something to that. It's still kind of early phases of what that actually is and which patients that is. Um, but that seems to be something that for some patients could be a portion of why their back, uh, is, is feeling the way that it is. Yeah. I think all that started when, um, a report came out in patients with recurrent disc herniations. So they've had a disc herniation, they may or may not have been treated, they get better, and then they have another disc herniation. And when they did the recurrent disc herniation surgery, they took that tissue and sent it out for microbiology evaluation because that group of patients also had an MRI finding where there's a lot of inflammation on the MRI, like basically bone marrow edema. And they found that a high, a high number of those patients had Propionis bacterium the bacteria that causes acne, they're slow, uh, slow growing anaerobic bacteria, bacteria that grows in the absence of oxygen and grows slowly. So that's where that came from. And then people started treating patients with recurrent disc herniations and motor changes with just antibiotics and found out they got better. And then the next thing is to start treating patients with antibiotics. So in my mind, it's not clear what the problem is. I doubt that's the main cause. It may be a cause, but it's probably not the main, the main cause. Right. And one I've heard also from several people that antibiotics are also anti-inflammatory. So if you give somebody Keflex for like what looks like an early wound problem, it's amazing how fast that gets better. And a dermatologist patient of mine told me that um, antibiotics have a very strong anti-inflammatory effect, and that's part of what we see. So I think the jury's still out on why things like doxycycline work. I think there's gonna be a group of patients that actually have a, a very low level in infection. We call it an indolent infection. My guess is that it, that's a small proportion of patients. Um, there's a group of patients that have a super infection due to 
previous surgery or an injury. Injured tissue tends to get infected more easily than normal tissue. Um, and then there's a group of patients that benefit from an anti-inflammatory effect of the antibiotics, not an antimicrobial effect. So um, we should keep an eye on that, but that's a really good question. And whoever asked that is really smart. It is now 6.01, we're a minute over. So unless anybody has any burning questions, um, I'd like to thank Dr. Darrington. I also want to thank Brittany. She's sitting right over there. Lean that way, Brittany, from Cavalier. <laughs> oh, they can see you? Yeah. <laughs> if it wasn't for her, we'd be completely lost on the internet. Uh, and I hope that this was helpful. And uh, we are going to put the recorded portion of this on YouTube and our websites and social media. So if people want to go back and look at it or they know people that missed it and want to see it, just let them know that we'll, we'll have the recorded uh, video of this session somewhere in our social media. And hopefully we'll do another one of these in a month or two. And with that in mind, please let us know how we did. Um, make suggestions on future webinars and future topics because I really do enjoy this, this kind of uh, event because I learn a lot. I'm like a, a sponge. Anything you'd like to say, Dr. Darrington? No, I think this is a lot of fun. The hour always goes fast. Uh, I hope that uh, everybody got a lot out of it and try to answer as many questions as we can. But um, if you guys have questions for either one of us, uh, all of our contact info should have been added there and uh, you know we can be reached uh, that way. So happy to carry on the conversation as needed. Thank you, Dr. Darrington. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and best wishes. Stay healthy and safe. Have a great weekend, everybody.